Good morning. Welcome to Faith Free Lutheran Church. Nice to see all of you here with us this morning. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. This is the day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. To that end, we open our worship service in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. I invite you to stand and join with me in our call to worship. O God, for our redemption, you gave your only begotten Son to the death of the cross, and by his glorious resurrection delivered us from the power of the enemy. Grant that all our sin may be drowned through daily repentance, and that day by day we may arise to live before you in righteousness and purity forever. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our opening hymn is hymn number 104. We'll sing together, Christ the Lord is risen today. Hymn number 104.
us bow together before the Lord and confess our sins. Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess to you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. Therefore, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy and ask you for Christ's sake, grant us forgiveness of all our sins, and by your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you and of your will and true obedience to your word, to the end that by your grace we may come to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. It is because of promises like this in the word of God, from the mouth of God himself, and because of the completed work of Jesus Christ on the cross in your place, I declare to you that your sins have been forgiven. Amen. And now I'd invite you to stand as you are able in respect for the reading of God's word. The psalm for today is found in Psalm 19. That is on page 853 in your pew Bible. Psalm 16. Keep me safe, O God, for in you I take refuge. I said to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. As for the saints who are in the land, they are the glorious ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those will increase who run after other gods. I will not pour out their libations of blood or take up their names on my lips. Lord, you have assigned me my portion and my cup. You have made my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I, will, I have set the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure, because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. The Old Testament lesson is found in Isaiah, chapter 25, verses 6 through 9. This is on page 1095 in your pew Bible. Isaiah 25, beginning at verse 6. On this mountain, the Lord God Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines. On this mountain he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove the disgrace of his people from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. In that day they will say, Surely this is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. The epistle lesson for today is in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. This is on page 1789 in your pew Bible. 1 Corinthians 15, beginning at verse 1. Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, 
which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you. Otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also, as to one untimely born. For I am the least of the apostles, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it was I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believed. Here ends the reading of God's word. Now it is with great joy and delight that we join together with the church for all time and in all places to confess our holy Christian faith. This morning we use the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven, and is seated on the right hand of the Father, and he shall come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe one holy Christian and apostolic church I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. call for the children for the children's sermon. All right. Now I'm going to ask you guys to vote on something, but there is one rule. You can't vote for yourself. Okay? Who do you think in church is the best at hide and seek. What's your vote, Stephen? Sam is the best. At, he is pretty good at hiding. He is. Simon, you think I'm the best at hide and seek? <laughs> I I'll take that. All right, Milo. James is the best at hide and seek. Hannah, do you know who to vote for? Sam, Sam, you got two votes. Your siblings are on your side. And he's cleverly hidden in the back corner of the sanctuary. So, he's <laughs> doing it. so now I might have a sillier question. Okay? But I want you to think about it. 
how good do you think Jesus is at hide and seek? Do you think he's the best? The best of every. The best of every. <laughs> In the world of worlds. Do you think Jesus can snap his fingers and he can hide wherever he wants? So, what's today? Easter. What happened on Sunday. Easter? What happened on Easter? Stephen? Jesus rose from the dead. What that means and what you want to listen for during the sermon today is there's one place where we don't look for Jesus. Where don't we look for Jesus? No. In the tomb. We know that he's not there because he rose again. And so the sermon today, we're going to talk about all the places we look for Jesus. And the place we don't look for him is the tomb. Yeah, Stephen. Oh, okay. So, let's pray and then get ready for the offering. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this, these children. Thank you that you sent your son to die on the cross for our sins and that you rose again and conquered death and the devil in our place, Lord. And pray that you would help us to hear your word today and that we would celebrate with the whole church that Jesus has risen. Amen. Now we'll call forward our ushers to receive our morning offerings. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Almighty God, you kept your promise and delivered up your own Son to be our Savior. By his sacrificial death, our sins are forgiven, and by his rising again, we have the hope of everlasting life. Keep us in this holy joy throughout the Easter season and all our daily lives, that we may not fear our enemies nor give in to the temptation of despair in our days of trouble. Protect and deliver all those who have been persecuted and imprisoned for the sake of your name, especially the Christians suffering in the Middle East under ISIS and in Afghanistan, Alimujang and Bao in China, in Kiflu, Haley, in Kudani, in Eritrea. 
Be with the administrators, pastors, missionaries, and church workers of the AFLC. Keep them faithful to deliver to your people the apostolic gospel of your son's death, burial, and resurrection. We pray especially this morning for Maxwell, Libby, Court, Caden, John, Sam, Wen, and Zhang Hong, Pastor Eric and Andrea, Brett, Isaac, Dr. Daniel and Hannah, and Wanda. Let us hold fast to the word preached to us, that in receiving it with joy we may take our stand in it and be saved by it. Hinder all who would sow doubt into our hearts, and grant us courage to confess its truth in our life and conversation. Bless President Biden and all who make and administer our laws. Frustrate the forces of evil, and do not let our leaders cooperate with them or further their goals. Guard our armed forces as they stand watch for us at home and abroad. Let them serve with honor and integrity. Have mercy on the sick and those in any need, especially we pray this morning for Dan, Lesson Ann, Lori, Luther and Donna, Gerilyn, Dave, Judith, Esther, Barbara, Jean, James, Max, Paul, Pastor Steve, Mike, Ron, Naomi, the Laytons, John, those serving at City Life Center, and for all those in this Kingfield neighborhood. Let the dawning light of the new creation in Christ sustain them in faith. In accord with your will, grant them renewed health, a foretaste of their eternal healing in him. Give us joy in your son's great victory feast as he shares it with us from this altar. In the eating of his true body and the drinking of his precious blood and faith, overcome our sins by his forgiveness and swallow up our death in his life that we may be glad and rejoice in his salvation. We praise your holy name, O Lord, for all your servants who have departed this life in faith. We pray that you will not abandon us to Sheol, but that when we awake in the resurrection of all flesh, your presence will give us joy. We join today in singing eternal alleluias with innumerable angels and festal gathering, with the assembly of the firstborn enrolled in heaven, and with the spirits of the righteous made perfect. And we bring these petitions before you, dear Father, trusting in your mercy, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. You may be seated. As we prepare for the message this morning, I invite you to turn in your hymnal to hymn number 98. We'll sing together, Thine is the Glory. Again, special welcome to those of you who are visiting us this morning. 
Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I would at this time invite you to stand as I read the gospel lesson appointed for this Easter Sunday morning. The gospel lesson is taken from Mark 16, verses 1 through 8. That can be found on page 1584 in your pew Bible if you'd like to follow along. Reading in Jesus' name, Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 8. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they may go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb, and they were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who is crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Heavenly Father, these are your words, and your word is truth. We pray that this morning you would sanctify us in the truth, that you would convict us of sin in our lives for that is necessary, and that you would comfort and encourage us with the promises of your gospel in your name. Amen. You may be seated. Jesus has been dead since Friday. And on Sunday, the third day, according to the Jewish way of calculating time, which allowed for any part of one day to count as an entire day, a handful of women set about the task for that day. The Sabbath had passed, and they were occupying themselves with the practical matters of caring for Jesus' body. Jesus died on Friday, just before evening, and therefore was laid hastily in the tomb before the Sabbath arrived that evening. These women, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome, were heading to the tomb to finish the job of Jesus' burial. There's only one question on their minds that very first Easter Sunday morning. Who will roll away the stone from the entrance to the tomb? What they found was entirely unexpected. Instead of a sealed tomb and a corpse, they found the stone had already been rolled away, and an angel who relayed to them the good news. Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who is crucified. He is risen. He is not here. The statement of the angel that first Easter Sunday morning is so poignant that it is almost unsettling for us as we ponder it this Easter morning. You seek Jesus. He is not here. The notion of searching for and locating a Savior is embedded deep within the DNA of mankind. And so this morning, we're going to examine not whether indeed you are seeking Jesus, but where you are seeking him and why. And first, do you seek Jesus among the mortals who surround you. For many people, whether they believe in Jesus or reject him, they are seeking for a savior in and among the people around them. Some people seek their security in a relationship, in the love that comes from a companion, finding comfort in affection or infatuation or just companionship. Some derive their value in the approval of a loved one or of a superior, doing whatever it takes to please them and meet or even exceed their expectations. Others still seek salvation in the life of a too-good-to-be-true celebrity, what eventually develops into an obsession with the famous person or simply with fame in general vicariously seeking the adulation of the masses through someone who already has it. 
All of these, indeed, are gross generalizations and caricatures, yet they are close enough to the truth that each and every one of you knows exactly what I'm talking about and what I'm referring to, because they're all too common. Perhaps even this morning, you're willing to admit that it is you who struggles with some of this behavior, who fits into these paradigms. The Bible, however, never directs us to look for salvation in the activity or identity of some mere mortal. In fact, the Bible is quite honest about mortality. The themes of failure or of broken relationships or even of betrayal fill the pages of Scripture. Jesus himself knew this. His own family didn't believe him at first. One of his closest associates betrayed him. And that's in part why he ended up in a tomb in the first place. You seek Jesus among human relationships. He is not there. Second, maybe you don't struggle with seeking the wrong type of Savior. Maybe you struggle with seeking the right Savior in all the wrong places. Maybe you seek Jesus so that he can help improve your life. You seek him in the example that he set for you, hoping that in following Jesus' pattern, there, just below the surface, is some kind of formula that will work out well for you, and in the end, everything will come out all right. And so you strive to follow Jesus' standard of morality. You desire to emulate his love and compassion for others, especially for those less fortunate than you. You attempt to glean every bit of wisdom you can from his words in an effort to be successful or wealthy or popular or healthy. I saw a video clip this last week of a pastor claiming that Jesus was not a savior for poor people. And it was the most upside down, backwards, ridiculous thing I had ever seen on the internet, which is saying something. All of our striving to have Jesus improve our lives right here and right now must stop at Holy Week. Because Jesus didn't suffer to make your life easier or better or more fulfilling. In fact, Jesus himself promises that your life here, right here and right now, will be all the more difficult because you're identified with him. You seek Jesus in your success and in your prosperity. He is not there. Maybe you don't struggle with that either. In fact, it's easy to turn that into a caricature and scoff at it. Maybe you know and understand that Jesus died to forgive your sins. Maybe you believe that he is your savior from sin, death, and the devil. But maybe, maybe the only way you know how to apply what Jesus has done for you is through your experience or your feelings. Maybe you base your relationship with Jesus on some mountaintop experience at a Bible camp or a conference or a retreat where you finally connected with those emotions and you finally were convinced that Jesus saved you and you finally never ever felt closer to him than at that moment. And that's great. I hope you have moments like that in your past. But what happens when you come back to real life and you crash and burn and you fail in spite of your best efforts to muster up those good feelings? What happens when they don't come? Or what happens if you derive the assurance of your salvation from your perceived closeness with Jesus. 
Maybe you think that if you've been doing your devotions and praying and attending church and Bible study regularly and generally avoiding sin, you know you and Jesus are doing all right. I cannot tell you how many Christians I know right now who derive their relationship, their closeness to Jesus by their own obedience. It's dozens, if not hundreds. What happens when all that fails or sputters or evaporates? What if you missed your devotions one day and then the next day and the day after that and you look up and you realize you haven't read the Bible in months? What if you've forgotten to pray regularly, even when you've promised friends, family, co-workers, and other church members that you would indeed be praying for you? I think the most often phrase Christians utter is, I'll pray for you about that. What if it's easier to sleep in on Sunday morning or do something, anything else, on Wednesday night? What if... When you look inside yourself, you see more sin than success, more badness than goodness, and more wickedness than piety. What if you stop right now and consider that Jesus Christ doesn't make you feel anything at all? Just a blank screen a soundless cavern, empty space. Does that mean you and Jesus aren't okay? Maybe you try to get through life with the crippling fear that one wrong move or bad decision is going to completely negate the future God has laid out for you. That the next sin, whatever it might be, will be the sin that finally causes God to turn his back on you and abandon you. Is your sovereign God so wishy-washy that one bad move on your part is going to completely derail his plans? You seek Jesus in your experience or in your good works. He is not there either. So where is Jesus? Where do we find our Savior? He is where he has revealed himself to be, just as the angel told those women 2,000 years ago. There you will see him, just as he told you. Such an innocuous little phrase. And a phrase, many times reading the resurrection accounts of Jesus, I skip over that part because that doesn't have the exclamation point. That doesn't have the oomph but he will be where he has told you he will be. And so you find Jesus in his word, where from Genesis to Revelation, nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified and him raised from the dead is proclaimed to you. Jesus is in the very history of Israel, in the lives of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, David, and the myriads of others, pointing you to Jesus and not to them, and certainly not to yourself. Jesus is in the poetry of the Psalms, where his anguish and his triumphs are described vividly. I think it was Luther who said that every psalm is either a word about Jesus or a word of Jesus. And if Luther didn't say it, then he should have. Jesus is in the words of the prophets as they prepare the way for the Messiah. Jesus is there in the Gospels, walking, talking, breathing, healing, dying, and rising again. Jesus is in the letter to the churches, rebuking sin, forgiving sinners, and leading them to everlasting life. And there is Jesus in the book of Revelation, the very last book of the Bible, triumphant and returning, preparing an eternity for each one of us without pain or suffering or sin or death. And because you find Jesus in his word, you also find Jesus in the sacraments. 
Jesus was there in the water of your baptism, drowning your sinful nature and rising you again as a new creation, connecting you to his own crucifixion and resurrection, giving you God's name and adopting you as his child. And Jesus is here right now in the bread and wine of communion with his own body and blood to forgive your sins. You see Jesus here in the church Where two or three are gathered, there he is in the midst of them. Jesus is there as the word of God is read and that it is preached and as it is applied. Jesus is received in those same sacraments. And with all of this, the one reality we so often ignore is that you find Jesus in you with you all the time. It is only because of the reality of his death and resurrection, because of the truth of his death and resurrection preached to you in Scripture, and because of those realities applied to you, that you can say with every single believer, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, in the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and died for me. There you will find Jesus in exactly all of the places he told you he would be. But there's one last place where you won't find Jesus. You won't find him in another person to save you that way. You won't find him in your wealth, in prosperity, in good fortune. You won't find him in your experiences or in your good works. None of those things can save you. All of those are or might be products of your salvation. But lastly, you won't find Jesus in the tomb. The tomb is empty because he is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. As we sing our response back to God for his word this morning, and as we prepare to receive the Lord's Supper, invite you to turn in your hymnal, the hymn number 110. We'll sing together, Christ is risen. Alleluia.
As we purpose to come to the Holy Supper of our Lord Jesus Christ, we should carefully examine ourselves as St. Paul exhorts us. For this holy sacrament has been instituted for the special comfort and strengthening of those who humbly confess their sins and who hunger and thirst after righteousness. But if we do examine ourselves, we shall find nothing in us but sin and death from which we cannot set ourselves free. Therefore, our Lord Jesus Christ has had mercy on us and has taken on himself our nature that he might fulfill for us the whole will and law of God and for our deliverance suffer death and all that we through our sins deserve. And to the end that we should confidently believe this and be strengthened by our faith, he has instituted the holy sacrament of his supper in which he feeds us with his body and gives us to drink of his blood. Therefore, whoever eats of this bread and drinks of this cup, firmly believing the words of Christ, dwells in Christ, and Christ in him, and he has eternal life. We should also do this in remembrance of him, of his death, and how he was delivered for our sins and raised for our justification. And with grateful hearts, we should take up our cross and follow him, and according to his commandment, love one another, even as he has loved us. For we are all one bread and one body, even as we are partakers of this one bread and drink of this one cup. I do invite you to stand at this time and join with me in praying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same manner also, when he had eaten, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Now, as your hearts are prepared and as you're directed forward by the ushers, we invite you to come and receive the Lord's Supper. If you're visiting us this morning and would like to know more about what we believe and confess about Holy Communion, you can find an explanation printed in the front cover of your bulletin. Gluten-free wafers are available for those who prefer, and also the white is wine and the red is grape juice. You may be seated.
We thank you, almighty and everlasting God, for having refreshed us with these, your gracious gifts. We ask of your infinite mercy, mercy, strengthen our Christian faith, support us in the trials of life, and make us fervent in our love for you and our fellow men. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Before we receive the benediction, I invite you to stand as we sing our closing hymn together, hymn number 111, Lo, in the grave he lay. Receive the benediction, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for a few short announcements. Reminder that tonight there is no youth group. Continue to celebrate the risen Lord with your families in whatever way you celebrate. Uh, this Wednesday, however, we are starting up our Wednesday night Bible study. Uh, this is a brand new study we're going to be studying, starting on the book of Nahum. So if you haven't been coming, we will be doing a short little unit on the book of Nahum. All are invited. That starts at 7.30 in the church basement or online on our YouTube channel. This Thursday evening, council members, remember that we have a council meeting in the church office at 7. On the next Sunday, we're back to our normally scheduled programming with Sunday school and the worship service and youth group. Uh, WMF meets in two Saturdays in the church office at 9.30 for their regular monthly Bible study. Are there any other announcements? So... Several, multiple little birds told me that today is Gwen's birthday, and so far be it from us to not sing happy birthday to Gwen on Easter Sunday. discord sowed in our congregation than when an adult Haugen has a birthday. Let me tell you that. <laughs> oh, you have one. Well, then you should come. Whatever.
Yeah, no, we're good. So, yeah, yeah, you, we got to announce it. <laughs> some of you might already know this, but some of you might not. Uh, Kristen and I have been praying about this, and we have decided um, we're going to move to McIntosh at the end, uh, Minnesota at the end of the month. So we will be moving there, uh, close to my father-in-law there. And uh, this process has been challenging, but we're excited. It's not a burdensome one. We just know that we're going to really miss you guys because this is the church that I was confirmed as a Lutheran in. So a little, uh, little hard, but uh, we want to thank you guys and we will not be strangers. And we're going to go forth in the Lord and uh, start a new adventure. So we just thought that it was probably time to let you guys know that. So that's all. Yes. Yes. So the way I heard this going down is that John, being from Mississippi, said winters here were too wimpy for him. <laughs> so farther north and more towards the plains he goes to experience a real upper Midwestern winter. Mississippi was a thought, but the good Lord would not allow us to <laughs> Kind of a Macedonia moment for you guys, right? All right, well, we will certainly be praying for you uh, and sad that you're going, but uh, glad for uh, the next chapter in your lives and uh, seeing no other announcements. Thank you all for being here this morning. Go in peace and serve the Lord. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. <laughs>